Wars bring enormous suffering as well as terrible economic consequences. These consequences include the direct economic impact and the ones caused by sanctions. In this episode, we look at a key area, the global food supply and China's stockpile. The global food system was strained even before the Russia-Ukraine war broke out. Chaotic supply chains and unpredictable weather had already pushed food prices to their highest levels in about a decade. More than 20 days after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with no sign of a ceasefire, the world is now facing a food crisis as prices of key agricultural products from the Russian-Ukrainian region have spiked. Maybe you want to buy something now in bulk, you cannot buy it now. You just have to pick some things, few, few things for children to eat, for us to keep our life, move, move our life on. So that's what we are doing now. So we just pray things will be better. We just pray things will be better. Things are worse now. Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat, while Ukraine ranks fifth. Together, the two countries account for 19% of the world's barley supply, 14% of wheat, and 4% of corn. That's more than one-third of global grain exports. The two countries are also major suppliers of rapeseed, accounting for 52% of the world's sunflower oil export market. In the same highly concentrated global fertilizer supply chain, Russia is a major producer. <laughs> We are on a situation which is extremely problematic, uh, but still very uncertain. And the reason why I'm saying this, if it is correct, as you said, that Russia and Ukraine supply 30 percent, to be exact, uh, of the wheat in, in, in the world, a part of those of that production of those exports were already delivered. Today, if we look just at Ukraine, we have seven million metric tons of, of wheat to be delivered, which is 29 uh, percent of the overall exports over the year. And in the case of maize, we have 12 million metric tons, which is 36 percent of the overall maize production. What this means is that we have a gap of around in cereals of around 20 million metric tons. Now, the issue is, can this be covered by other countries, other key exporting countries like the U.S., Australia, and uh, now India is saying that they are going to export 7 million metric tons of wheat, uh, or Argentina? Uh, so that's the question right now. And if that is the case, then that can be, uh, the problem can be smoothed out, and we shouldn't go into a significant crisis. Since the conflict, Ukrainian ports have been unable to export grain, and grain traders have avoided purchasing from Russia due to financial sanctions. This is the time of the year when arable land recovers from winter and grows rapidly, but Ukrainian farmers have no way to plant for the spring. In other words, the wheat growing season in Ukraine will be interrupted by the war. Moreover, it isn't clear whether there will be enough farmers to cultivate the land. Global wheat prices are at an all-time high. Soaring natural gas prices have contributed to the problem of tight fertilizer supplies. Natural gas is a key ingredient in nitrogen-based fertilizers such as urea. Yara International, headquartered in Norway, is the world's largest supplier of mineral fertilizers. According to CNN, record high prices have forced the company to cut its ammonia and urea production in Europe to 45% of capacity. Its CEO predicts that the reduction in these two essential ingredients will have an impact on crop yields, which will have a ripple effect on the global food supply. Russia and Belarus are major exporters of fertilizers. Belarus is under sanctions, as well as being held accountable by the West for supporting Russia. It is now likely that the vast majority of traders and buyers in this market will be scared of the risks of potential sanctions that they won't approach Russian or Belarusian products. Many European and Central Asian countries used to get more than 50% of their fertilizer supply from Russia. Take growing wheat as an example. Wheat in Ukraine was sown last fall. After a short growth period, the plant went into winter rest. Now, at this time of the year, farmers must apply fertilizer to help the wheat plant break out, so that a plant can branch out at the stem node and produce more wheat ears. With proper fertilization, each wheat plant can branch out three to four stalks, multiplying the harvest. 
However, under the impact of war, Ukrainian farmers are now short of fertilizers and pesticides, and even if they have fertilizers, they lack the fuel to start the farm machinery. Some analysts have estimated that this year's wheat harvest in Ukraine may be sharply reduced by at least half. On March 12th, the Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food of Ukraine announced that the government has decided to temporarily ban exports of all types of fertilizers. Chris Lawson, head of fertilizers at market intelligence firm CRU Group, said current urea is trading close to $1,000 US dollars per metric ton, about four times the price at the beginning of 2021. On March 14th, Andrei Melnichenko, a billionaire in the Russian fertilizer and coal industry, said through a spokesman that the events in Ukraine are a tragedy and that peace is urgently needed. As a Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian, it is very painful and inconceivable to witness the war and death between brothers. According to the report, Melnichenko is a Russian national but was born in Belarus and his mother is Ukrainian. According to Melnichenko, one of the biggest victims of the crisis will be agriculture and food. The conflict has already caused fertilizer prices to soar and farmers can no longer afford it. The supply chain disrupted by the outbreak has become more distressed, which will lead to higher food inflation in Europe and food shortages in poor countries. For example, Ghana imports nearly a quarter of its wheat from Russia, according to data from the Observatory of Economic Complexity. The inflation has been disastrous for bakeries, whose sale prices are standardized by the National Bakers Association and have not risen since August. Many have had to reduce portion size or illegally hike prices to stay afloat. Really, the whole thing started from last year, June coming. Every month they will increase flour, not just flour, sugar, margarine, all things that we need to produce bread have been increased some on monthly or weekly basis and it's really 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 affecting the bakery industry whenever you are trying to stand then an increment will come then you need to go back again We have put in so much into it, we have sacrificed, we have been through a lot. So if this should bring it to an end, then uh, yeah, spending your whole life for the past 25 years working, and then just a short month or a year, something will then hit you to be out of business or your business is not doing well. It's very painful. In order to protect the stability of the domestic grain market supply, on March 10th, the Russian government decided to ban the export of cereals, including wheat, rye, barley, and corn, to the countries of the Eurasian Economic Union until August 31st, 2022. On March 14th, the Russian government temporarily banned the export of grain commodities to the countries of the Eurasian Economic Union and the export of sugar products to third countries. The ban on grain exports will be in effect until June 30th, and the ban on sugar products until August 31st. On March 11th, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations released a report indicating that international food and feed prices could rise as much as 22% due to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. It also said that Russia and Ukraine are expected to see a decline in food exports, only a portion of which will be replaced by other sources. Many least developed countries depend on these two countries for most of the wheat supplies. For example, Egypt and Turkey get about 70% of their wheat supply from Russia and Ukraine. We need to diversify the countries from which we import wheat. Definitely, we will resort to more expensive countries that export wheat, which would sell to us at prices that are not as cheap in Russia and Ukraine, like France, Germany, or other. Therefore, if the conflict is prolonged and supply is less, this will add pressures on balance of payments or the budget. Lebanon imports 90% of its wheat and cooking oil and they come exclusively from Russia. Data released by the World Bank shows that the wheat stock in Lebanon is only enough to last a month and a half. This situation sets off an alarm for the world. 
The cost of corn, soybeans, and vegetable oil has also been rising. This is despite the fact that the UN Food and Agricultural Organization has urged major food producing countries to refrain from imposing export restrictions on their own products. But countries have begun to reduce exports due to fears of shortages. Egypt has just banned exports of wheat, flour, lentils, and beans as the country becomes increasingly concerned about its food reserves. Indonesia has tightened its export restrictions on palm oil. Palm oil is an ingredient in packaged goods such as cooking oil, cosmetics, and chocolate. On March 10th, Lebanon announced a ban on the export of food products produced in Lebanon that are not covered by a special permit issued by the Ministry of Industry. Some countries are less at risk, such as Switzerland. While the rest of Europe grapples with surging prices, in Switzerland, inflation is so tame that some key costs are actually falling. Uh, Switzerland has um, uh, one of the strongest protection of the agricultural sector in the world after uh, South Korea, Iceland, uh, Norway, uh, Japan. So we are heavily protected farm, uh, farming industry. And this has led to high prices of food in general in Switzerland. And again, uh, similar to the fact that I've mentioned before uh, on the oil price, the same mechanism apply also to food prices. We are high level, but we have a strong Swiss rank. We have to spend less on imported food in relation to the whole uh, spending of the population. And therefore, the, the result for the consumers are not that drastic as they are maybe in other countries. So, what is the situation in China? At the end of 2021, statistics from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, showed that China had more than half of the world's stocks of corn, rice, wheat, and other major grains. By the first half of 2023's grain year, China's share of global grain stocks will be 69% for corn, 60% for rice, and 51% for wheat, according to the USDA's projected data. China's share of these major grain reserves has increased by about 20% in each category over the past 10 years, indicating that the CCP is continuing to stockpile grain. China's population is less than 20% of the world's population, yet it holds half of the global grain stocks. It's disproportionate. Many experts are concerned that it could push up global food prices and trigger food shortages elsewhere. The director of Japan's Institute for Resources and Food Studies believes that China's large grain reserves are one of the reasons for higher global food prices. We have no way to verify whether the massive stockpiling of grain by the CCP a year ago is related to the war in Ukraine that broke out this year. Truth be told that China does have a problem of food shortages. Chinese President Xi Jinping mentioned in a recent meeting on March 6, 2022, that some people say that international supplies are plentiful and that it costs more to grow them than to buy them. But the land in China isn't planting soybeans, corn, or cotton. When the international market gets bad, it will then be too late to grow one's own. He said, with food in our hands, there is no panic in our heart. A week ago, she expressed a similar idea, saying that the rice bowl of Chinese people should be filled with the grain grown in China. According to official statistics from China, in 2021, its total grain production was 682 million tons and imports were 164 million tons, with an external dependence of nearly 20%. In China, grains are classified into three types, grains, soybeans, and potatoes. The supply of wheat in China is not a big problem. Soybeans, however, are problematic because of the high dependence on foreign imports. Currently, China's soybean imports come mainly from the US and Brazil, accounting for 70-80% to 80 of China's soybean imports, with a small amount imported from Russia. In the past, China's northeastern provinces were the main production areas for soybeans. But it faces strong competition from the genetically modified soybeans from the US that offer lower prices and higher oil content. Along with the low procurement price for domestically produced soybeans in China, many farmers have given up growing soybeans. One of our episodes discussed Haigong, the first city that went bankrupt in China. It's located in one of the three northeastern provinces. Haigong is virtually a snapshot of how the economy of the three northeastern provinces of China has gone into serious decline. China has always been short of food due to institutional factors. 
On the one hand, large tracts of good land have been polluted by industries or used as industrial land. On the other hand, the CCP's policy of suppressing food prices, coupled with draconian taxes, has discouraged farmers from planting grains. A large number of migrant workers whose majority is from rural China are moving to the cities, leaving many arable lands deserted and causing the systematic shortage of food supply. In the face of the food crisis brought about by the war, China will inevitably be affected. Only the magnitude of damage will be relatively small compared to some countries. On February 23rd, the day before Russia announced its special military operation, the Shanghai representative of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry received an email from his Ukrainian supplier. He was told that his goods were ready to ship to China, but everything was put on hold since the sudden outbreak of armed conflicts. The crisis affected practically all logistic channels and supply chains. <sighs> The impact of the conflict is terrible. One of our partners had booked over a dozen containers of goods which had been prepared for shipment, but the supply chains have all been broken, while our inventory has sold out. Everybody has been waiting for the supply.